Peter was right in 1 Peter 3.16 when he said, when you study Paul, you got to put your thinking cap on. He was absolutely right. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to put your thinking cap on to the ministry of the Holy Spirit as we teach this this morning. Notice the subject matter, the imputation of Christ's righteousness. The imputation of Christ's righteousness. You're not righteous because you do things. You do things because you're righteous. You do righteous things because you're righteous. You don't do them to become righteous. Okay? So let's have a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude types, sins of the tongue or overt sins. That's some of it. If you want out of carnality, and you should, because that will bring discipline to your life. He doesn't push you out of the car. He loves you and woos you back to fellowship with him. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins because we are a priest in this dispensation, every believer is a priest, 1 Peter 2. It's your responsibility to deal with sin in your life. Personal sin. How do I do it? I 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. And so, our Father, we thank you that we take responsibility for our own priesthood through the indwelling Holy Spirit's ministry, when we get carnal, when we commit personal sin, we have to confess it to be restored to spirituality through the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for that principle, Father, for it keeps us on our toes in the spiritual realm of the angelic conflict in Jesus' name. Amen. As I mentioned in my introduction, where we're looking at is a different legal term in verses 15 through 21. It is the word transgression. You've probably heard that word and never understood what it meant. You look up in the English dictionary and you still don't know what the biblical word means. This is the word para panoma. It is very important that you understand it. It is different than the word that's used 14, 15, in 12, 13, 14, and 15, it's different. That it's a, uh, uh, the first three verses, it's a different word. It's a word in the English transgression. <laughs> it's used seven times. One time it's used in italics. But it's used all the, every time it's transgressed, it's used transgression. It's using this Greek word, parapatoma. And that's very important that you understand it because it's another look at the legal part of Adam's sin and how it affected the human race. I'm, I'm still amazed after all these years that there is confusion in Christianity about what sin a person has to be saved from. Most evangelism that occurs out here today, at least in America as I know it, is always emphasizing personal sin in order to be saved. Personal sin in the life of an unbeliever is a non issue. It's a non issue. The issue in salvation for an unbeliever is a damning sin. There are 13 judicial charges which he's not committed, he's a member of the human race, and his ancestral person is the one that passed it on to him. Verse 12, wherefore is by one man Adam, sent him to the world, and death by sin, and so it passed on to all mankind. The sin death. Personal sin is an issue for believers. Now here's what people do when they're talking to somebody about salvation. They bring the Big Ten out. They say to them, well, you never lied, you never cheated, you never stole, you never did this, you never did that. Well, of course. 
But suppose you find someone that has a very strong moral code, like the rich young ruler. Well, no, I, don't, I haven't lied. I didn't cheat. I have a moral code. I have moral integrity. What are you going to do with him? What are you going to do with the rich young ruler? When your whole platform is personal sin, you need to confess your personal sin in order to be saved. That's not true. That's not a biblical truth. That is true for a believer, he must confess his sin. But an unbeliever doesn't. He believes with his heart. And then confession comes from his mouth. Oh, pray, pray tell me you know a different way for that in your life. It is the born-again heart that speaks the truth out of his mouth. Your mouth can speak all kinds of foolishness. It don't mean anything. It's what in your heart that really matters anyhow, doesn't it? That's where all your choices in life come from. It's from your heart. That's the story of Romans 10. That's often misquoted. You have to, people have to understand that it all, listen, if you want a Bible verse to give to somebody, give them Romans 5.12. They need to be saved because they're under Adam's sin. And there's no way out except through Jesus Christ. The death on the cross took care of Adam's sin and all personal sin. It took care of the unbeliever and the believer. That's why we confess our sin as a believer. We don't confess our sin as an unbeliever. What sin could you possibly confess? You're under 13 judicial penal code judgments. I mean, I've never heard anybody, well, I confess that I'm dead. I confess... I've never heard about that I'm blind, that I'm alienated from God, I'm under the curse, I'm condemned, I'm in darkness, I'm under death. That's all true. And that's the penal code you're under. What does people have to confess? That I believe Jesus died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. That's what I had to believe in order to be saved. I didn't understand this all, all this other stuff. The Holy Spirit convicted me of three things, and he convicted you whether you know it or not. John, the 16th chapter, he convict, convicted you of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. He got me on judgment. He may have got you on sin. He may have got somebody else on righteousness, but he got me on judgment. Without Christ, I was, going, I was under the death sentence, and if I died without Christ, then I was under, I was spiritually dead, separated from God in time. If I died without faith in Christ, I'd be separated from God for all eternity. That's called the second spiritual death in, in Revelation. <clears throat> That's what got me. The judgment part got me. Very clearly in my heart to this day, I know that. I didn't want to die and go to hell. When the gospel is preached, I want her conviction of sin, judge, judgment, and righteousness, but judgment is the one that got me. One of those is going to get you or got you. I'm just trying to explain the theology of all this to you. I'm just trying to explain the theology. I'm trying to explain what Paul explained to you. What makes the lesson today unique is Paul's contrast between the judicial charges of Adam's sin with the judicial judgment of the grace of Christ. What makes this passage so unique, at least in theology, is how Paul contrasted the transgression, the judicial charges of Adam's sin that he called transgression, and how he put the judicial justice of the grace of God up against it. And you'll see it. I laid this thing out on your paper because I don't want you to miss this. I don't want you to miss it. Now, here's my point number one. I got three points. Last week, we talked about power bases. This week, we're talking about that should be par That's a T, not an R. That should be P-A-R-A-P-T. 
P-T. That ought to be, that's, there's not an R there, there's a T. Potoma. The word transgression is also used as a legal term. For example, Barbara Potoma deals with the violation and the judgment of the penal code of the Enoch law of Genesis 2.17. The emphasis, parabasis, listen to me now, parabasis, the emphasis of parabasis in Genesis 2.17 was don't eat of the tree. In the day you eat of the tree, stipulation, remember, it has a stipulation. In the day you eat, dying you will die. The emphasis parapotoma is on the violation of the judgment that comes from it. Dying you will die. You understand that? Th these, are penal, these are legal terms of in the penal code. I have to explain it to you because you're not going to find that in the word transgression. You've got to understand that. This is translated into English as transgression. And it, it's judicial. People all the time say to me, I have pastors call, write me. They go like, where do you get the idea of uh, 13 judicial charges? <clears throat> it's very easy to get them. I take them to Romans 5 because two legal terms are used. Judicial terms are used. And then I was fortunate to be able to have a church that allows me to study. Rather than run around doing things, they want me to study so they can run around and do things, and I can come in and teach you. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that. So, Parapatoma deals with the violation and the judgment of the penal code of the Enoch Law of 217 with the emphasis on dying you will die, the judgment part of it. Power of basis set up the one, if the stipulation, do not eat from the tree in the day you eat, then you got power of potoma, dying you will die. That's a given. The judgment will the judgment will come. Judgment will come. When you find the word in the English Bible transgression and what's good is they translate it every time the same way in our passage you will find it in verses 15 16 17 18 and 20 this is why paul introduces the mosaic law as a subject of one time 520 he introduces the mosaic law you know why the mosaic law is judicial is showing you there's a judicial deal here. In verse 20, he introduces the Mosaic Law. He says the law, capital L, came in so that the transgression, Adam's original sin, would increase, would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. The question is, why the Mosaic Law? Would that be fair? Since Paul introduced it in verse 20, it's fair to ask, then why, did, why put the law? Why did God give us the law? The answer Paul wrote in the book of Galatians. Point number two. In Galatians, the third chapter, 19 through 25, Paul gave a wonderful doctrinal answer to this question that is important to our lesson. Then why the Mosaic law? In verse 19 of Galatians 3, Paul writes, why the law then? He said, it was added because of the what? Transgression. Guess what word we're dealing with, right? It was added because of Adam's transgression. Having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator, I tell the seed, the answer is why the Mosaic law? Well, it was added because of Adam's transgression. Number two, Mosaic law is essential until what? Circle the word until, because once this happens, the Mosaic law is not of importance. As much as what is to come. What is to come outweighs the Mosaic law. Because... It is a he who is coming, and Matthew 5.17 says, 
when Christ comes, he will fulfill and abolish the Mosaic law. He will fulfill it and abolish it. Abolishing it by fulfilling it. Watch this now. An agency of a mediator until the mediator comes. We got an agency running it until the mediator comes. Until the seed, that's Genesis 3.15, by the way. That's the seed Christ. Until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made, like Genesis 3.15, the first prophetic prophecy of Christ. Why the law? Why the law? The law was added because of Adam's sin. And what, why the law? To point, listen, you're going to hear it in a minute, to point people to the coming of Christ. The law. The law would be essentially important to hold men accountable. Nobody can keep the law. Therefore, it's proof that you are a sinner through Adam. When Christ would come, the law like John the Baptist, the law would be separated. The law would disappear because Christ would come and fulfill it. Matthew 5.17. You don't need the law to prove to people they're sinners. What you have to do with people today in the day of Messiah is to preach the good news to them. Until the seed. Look at verse 24 and 25 on your paper. Therefore the law. So what conclusion can we make? The word therefore is a trailer hitch. To everything that Paul has said from verse 19 on. Therefore we draw this conclusion. The law has become our tutor to what? You ought to circle that. To do what? To lead us to Christ. Why? Because the law condemns you. The law always condemns you. The law of the unique law, the law in the Garden of Eden condemns you. The Mosaic law, you can't keep it. it you can't keep it unless you're God himself. It condemns you. It shows you you need a Savior. Therefore, the law has become our tutor, our tutor to lead us to Christ, to lead a tutor. You're condemned. How are you going to get out of your state? Christ. He came to the world. He died on a cross. He was buried. He was raised from the dead the third day. That's how you get out. That's the only way you get out. It's not only, it, it is the only way. It is the only way. Now, here's the divine purpose. The law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. Here's the divine purpose of leading you to Christ. The law leading you to Christ. So that we, having been led to Christ, may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are what? And the tutor of what? The law. You no need, no need a teacher of the law. The law is a nun issue. Now the issue is Christ. Why did Christ come into the world? Paul said it in 1 Timothy 1.15. Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. How did I become a sinner? Through Adam. All have what? Sin. Romans 5.12. All have sin. Sin. Now, there's space on your paper. Bottom of your paper, you got some space? Huh? Draw two circles over here. Draw two circles. I know, we're in first grade. Draw two circles. I spent uh, three days with, my, with Ben and Evelyn. Ben is in kindergarten, and Evelyn is in 
I don't know what they call it when three-year-olds go. She calls it going to school. Preschool. So we were talking about colors. That's interesting. Primary colors. You know what's difficult for a three-year-old who has just learned the primary colors? Secondary colors. <laughs> now that seems pretty silly to you and I because we're in the, we leave secondary colors and we mix them up and we come up with our own stuff. And they're magical. But you know, when you have to learn primary colors, and you introduce secondary colors, you can forget that secondary color idea. It doesn't matter what a robin looks like. Because whatever colors she see are primary. They're not secondary. So I want you to get some primary so that you can actually go to secondary. So you got two circles now. I've wasted some time. On the left, or uh, however you want to do it, I don't care. On one of the circles, write Adam. On the other circle, write Christ. The circle that has Adam put 13 judicial charges. That's Adam's sin. Alienated. You don't have to write all that stuff. Pick up a, ba a brochure on 50 things. It'll tell you what the... these. Listen, this goes with the human race. If you're born human... There you got him. And underneath that, write Adam's original sin. And under that, write unsaved. Every unsaved person is in Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. In Adam all what? Die. In Christ all are made alive. In Adam all die. There's no exceptions except for Jesus Christ, who was born outside the slave market of sin. He didn't come down the pike like everybody else did. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit, then born of the Virgin Mary. All right? Now, between, and on the other circle, you got Christ. In between these two circles, put the symbol for the burial, the death, burial, and resurrection. You know, put the cross, die, line down to burial, and a line up for resurrection. You got it? That's... That's my symbol, for Christ died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead third day. Underneath, above that cross, put the gospel. Underneath that cross, put Colossians 1.13. I want you to really learn this. I can't tell you how many times I, I use this, these very three symbols, explaining the gospel to people. This is how I explain the gospel. I make him take a napkin, because I'm usually Chick-fil-A. So we take a napkin and we start, we start doing our business. We draw these three circles. Every man starts. And I put 1 Corinthians 15, 22 above Adam, and I put it above Christ. In Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. How do I get from one circle to the other circle is the issue. And that's the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 tells you what the gospel is. It's Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and raised from the dead according to the scriptures. Romans 1.16 says, The gospel, which I just explained, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Not the one who works. Not the one who goes through some kind of penance. <laughs> the one who believes. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, under the gospel, is what? For by grace we are saved through faith and not of ourselves. It's a what? Gift of God, not of what? Right? Least any man should boast. Right? Now, here's Colossians 1.13. Are you familiar with Colossians 
It's dynamite. Take your pencil and from Adam's circle, watch me, look up here. Just do a loop over to the cross. <coughs> and while you're there, stay at the cross and take another loop over to Christ. Now, here's what Colossians 1.13 says. That Jesus Christ re re rescued us. That loop from Adam to the cross says that he rescued us from the domain of darkness. That's Adam's judicial charges. Rescued. Rescued by the grace of God, by the work of Christ on the cross, buried and raised from the dead. The gospel is the power of God. The gospel is the power of God to save you. Not what you do. It's what he's done for you so that you can be saved by grace and not of yourself. He rescues you. And at the same time that he rescues you when you believe the gospel, watch this. He transfers you. The word from the cross to the circle of Christ is transferred. He transfers you. into the kingdom of the beloved son. So you ought to have an R on one, and you ought to have a T on the other. Agreed? Rescued from Adam's judicial charges and transferred into the kingdom of the beloved son. You understand that? At that point, you're saved. Now watch. Take a line... And draw it all the way through Adam, Adam's circle. Draw a line through it. Because that's done. The moment you believe the gospel, all of humanity is gone. In that moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of God saves you and the grace of God delivered you. And that circle is no longer an issue in your life ever. No more alienation, no more curse, no condemnation, no darkness, no death, no enmity, no, no natural man anymore, no sinner, no unrighteous, no, no ungodly under the wrath of God. All gone. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself is a gift. Look at your back page. Look at your back page. Paul picked up the subject of the two federal heads of the human race in our lesson, first Adam and last Adam, and he put it, does a comparison. Now, I want you to look at 15, 16, 17. Under 17, before you get to 18, draw a little line under there because I want you to see there's a separation Paul separates versus 15, 16, and 17, and he comes back and repeats key issues in verses 18, 19, 20, 21. And so we have the first Adam, federal head of the unsaved. The federal head of the saved is Jesus Christ. And look how Paul, look how Paul does. One man, Adam. One man, Jesus Christ. We have the transgression. We have the grace of God. Many died. The free gift of God abounds to many. And now watch. I put a doctrinal principle that's key. I put a doctrinal principle to every one of these. He says the free gift is not like the transgression. How about that? What kind of a gift? What kind of a gift? You know what, you know what that means? Listen, let me tell you what that means. No, wait. wait. Don't jump to a conclusion. God wants you to write this down. I want you to write, uh, here's what it means. It means Galatians 5, 1, and 13. Because what free means is freedom. What free means is freedom. What free means, well, look, if I wrote the word freedom on the board, what would be the key, what would be the word? Thank you. Huh? 
the free gift. Now, we know it's the, the gift is grace, but free. What have we been freed? We are in freedom. What have we been freed from? 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin. You understand? No. That's the word free, freedom. Galatians 5, 1 and 13. Come on, people. I know. This is Bible study. I know. That's why I got the Bible out and reading it. Now, for many die, now, free gift is not like the transgression. Free, freedom, freedom. Over here in Adam, you're in the domain. You, you're reigning under death over here uh, under grace and life. In verse 16, the key words on Adam's side is sin, like in, in Romans 5.12, judgment. One transgression and condemnation. On the other side, under Christ, the free gift arose because of the many transgressions and justification. Notice a doctrinal point that Paul makes. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. The one who sinned puts you in bondage. The one who brought you out puts you into freedom. There is no way to compare the bondage from the freedom. The gift is not like. Then in verse 17, the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one. On the Christ side, we received abundant grace. That's, that's, that's at John 10, 10. The gift of righteousness, the gift of righteousness, and where we have in verse 17... Uh, oh, let me, let me, verse 16 has, gift is not like that which come through the one who sinned. In verse 17, death reigned over here, reigning in Christ, reigns in life, reigns in life. Over in Adam, reigns, that's, that's a ki the kingdom of the domain of darkness. And here is a, a central point, a point of importance, much more those who receive the abundance, the abundance, <coughs> the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign on life through the one Jesus Christ. Listen to me. <laughs> You're going to miss this. This death that reigns, listen to me, is attached to the human race. Now listen to me. You say, how do you know that? I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you. Write, that, write this down, and I'll give it to you. Write down Revelation, the 20th chapter, 20th chapter, verses 14 and 15. This Adam sin runs the whole course throughout the whole human race. Because when you get to Revelation 20, you know when you're in 10 through 15, you're in the judgment seat, the great white throne judgment seat. When death and Hades is cast into the lake of fire. You know where that death is? That death started way back with Adam. That's the death that started with Adam. And it's going to run all the way to the end of human history. It's a human history deal. It's humanity deal. Then in verses 18, 19, 20, 21, I want you to look. There are key phrases that show the greater comparison. Now Paul is going to pull key doctrines out and say... These are the ones, and I call them gate questions. I say, these are, could be the things. This is like a teacher that says to the class, if I was you, I'd write this down because you'll probably see it again. That's a teacher saying, I'm going to get this on the test to you. Did you have wonderful teachers like I did? Thank God for those wonderful people who gave me a head start on my finals. This is what he's doing. So then through, one, through the one transgression, condemnation to all men, on Christ's side, even so through one act of righteousness, we have justification to all mankind. And then he makes a point. Even so through one act of righteousness, it results justification of life to all men. Then verse 19, for as through one man's disobedience over on Christ, even so through the obedience of one. Over on Adam's side, many are made sinners. Over on this side, many are made righteous. Philippians 2.8. Now listen to Philippians 2.8. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled. We've been doing a study on Tuesday night. The third floor 
of the edification complex of the human soul under the word of God as it develops from a baby to an immature to mature believer who reaches his maturity in Christ and maintains it. We call that super grace just to distinguish that this is a person who has reached spiritual maturity and has chose to stay in it. He gives eight, Paul in Colossians, the third chapter, 12 through 14, he gives eight, eight virtues of spiritual maturity, those who reach it and maintain it. When you start with the bottom floor of salvation and go floor by floor up from salvation, the third floor is humility. Do you know why that's important? Do you know why all eight are important? Because all eight of these put Christ on the cross on our behalf. All eight, all eight that Paul listed is why Christ, it is the virtue that Christ had to die for our sins. So I'm going to come back to the word humble because you missed it. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient which is our word in Romans 5, by becoming obedient to the point of death, yes, death on the cross. You can read the rest. I'm out of time. The imputation of Christ's righteousness. You don't earn it. You're given it by the grace of God at the point of salvation. You're given the righteousness of Christ as a gift. That's positional truth. Now, it's your responsibility to produce it in your life through the word of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We call it experiential righteousness. It's your responsibility. It's it's the way you make choices in your life. Reflect your relationship with the Lord. The choices you make. Let's pray. If you're here today, every head bowed and every head closed, if you're here today both by the internet or the automobile, you must understand that you're under 13 judicial charges. It has nothing to do with personal sin. It has to do with the sin that's been passed on to you, the genetics of the human race through Adam. The secret is to get out of that and get into the relationship with Christ. How do I do that? Well, it's as simple as the gospel. Christ died on that cross for your sins, not his. That's Adamic sin and personal sin. He was buried on the third day, raised from the dead. And when you believe it, you are rescued from the domain of darkness. You're, re you're rescued from the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin that you could never erase, may not even though you have them but you're under that judgment. That's called judgment. But when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ is simple act of volition because you do have free will, he transfers you out of that domain of darkness of existence with God into a real light, wonderful, not darkness, but light, spiritual light, revelation in your soul. Do you believe the gospel? Oh, I didn't say, did you hear it? I mean, do you believe it? Then you call upon him. You thank him if you believe that. You thank him for sending his son to die in your place. In Adam all die, but in Christ all live. Thank him that you now live 
and it becomes his responsibility as your father to begin to nurture you and take care of you, and we will help that. If you'll go to our website, doctrinalstudies.com, there's all kinds of information there for new, new believers. We'd encourage you to do that. For we've met our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.